It's Wednesday, July 24th of 2024. It is, and this is the endo meeting. The weather is hot. Uh, today on the agenda, we have um, uh, a lot of topics, it turns out. Mark uh, has, has brought forth to this council a dispute between, apparently, Matthew and me and uh, on, on the other side, Richard, and we know not what the dispute is, and we will dig into get that and figure out what it is uh, and come to a decision. Um, secondly, I have a proposal I would like a blessing from this group on with regard to the evolution of the compartment API toward parity with XS. And then uh, ZB and Leo bring to the table three topics, one touching upon content security policies with CES, one touching upon... Uh, two touching up on Hermes. Yeah, two touching on Hermes. Okay. Um, with that, Mark wishes to discuss. Do you have the pull request number, Mark? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm on my iPhone. I don't have it in front of me. Um, okay. I'll, 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 um, I'll, I'll hum a few bars. So my understanding is that we have. Uh, in the compartment API, currently there is a globals or endowments that are threaded, uh, that are threaded, and uh, into the the newly constructed compartment. And currently, copied uh, by a long long time decision, we decided that the properties of the of the given globals would be copied using the semantics of object dot assign onto the global this of the compartment. This is as opposed to grafting the pro the the prototype pardon, we're grafting the properties of the given endowments onto the global this, which would trend, which has um which would have slightly different semantics. For one, accessors and uh, getters and setters would be transferred and would see a different this property. Um would see it would, would see the global this of the compartment as their this instead of the instead of the the this of instead of seeing the global properties object as it's this binding which could be confusing it also means that accessors would be trapped late so the host would have to be more careful about creating uh about endowing accessors and uh, getters and setters uh onto uh onto a compartment but we decided for the purposes of globals versus global properties that with globals you can uh with globals we would just do the thing that is safer by default and use object assign as semantics but if you really 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 wanted to shoot yourself in the foot and knew what you were doing you still have the global this object that you would be able to do uh to graft properties onto and that would be yeah. much more obvious and deliberate Okay. okay. Let, let, let me uh, uh, just mention two things that are might not jump out at people about object sign semantics, both of which are relevant here, uh, which is that unlike object keys, so object keys and object assign semantics both have the property that they access the property's value rather than get the property's descriptor, i.e. if it's an accessor property, it does a get on the accessor to get the value and then copies the value. Um, uh, they both have the, the, you know, they both do um, only enumerable own properties, but object assign includes symbol named properties and object keys does not. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's one of the odd things about object assign we need to be aware of. Uh, the other odd thing Mark, about Mark, to clarify, object assign does copy symbols, right? That's right. Object okay. assign copy symbols. Uh, object dot keys does not enumerate symbol named properties. It only enumerates string names. Do we have a controversy between? Uh, do you know of a controversy about whether to include symbols or not? Because my understanding is that everybody on the table, everybody involved, is in favor of symbols being transferred. So the reason why this difference is relevant is the actual motivation for the PR in question is whether to include symbol named properties on the inescapable global, because the existing implementation for the inescapable global did not include, used object.keys to enumerate, and therefore 
omitted symbol name properties. That was actually the only motivation for starting on that PR. And then the PR got into this whole morass of controversy around all of these other issues because okay. it touched this at all. Okay. Yeah, okay. The, so the, so I the, think that the, the controversy was, was, pardon, the controversy was brought because of this, but is not covered, does not cover this. Right. And then the other thing, which is relevant to a controversy that is on the table, that uh, is part of object assigned semantics, is the, and this is the, the focus of, of Richard's counter argument, uh, is that object assigned creates innumerable properties on the target versus the JavaScript convention for global properties, properties on the global this object, is the vast, vast majority of them are non-enumerable. Uh, the enumerable, enumerable ones are a very small set of, of things that can be considered exceptions. So by using object assigned semantics, we're adding to the global enumerable properties, which violate sort of the normal expectation for global properties. Richard, am I getting, am I summarizing your position fairly accurately? Yeah, I think, I think so. Okay. Yeah. So that actually touches on both inescapable globals and globals and right. and that we should behave in a way that is consistent between the two and also consistent with this print this principle okay uh all right so then the uh that introduces the other the, the other dimension of this is globals versus inescapable globals and um compartment api does not currently support inescapable globals but we can fake it um by grafting onto the globals in a in a wrapped wrapped constructor which is problematic for wrapped constructor issues and any anyway, the wrapped constructors come into play because inescapable globals are inescapable and and what that means is that every compartment Every compartment is born with a, a new compartment constructor inside of its global this, and that global constructor inherits a variety of relationships from the constructor that begat the, cons the, the constructor. Um, uh, with excess and soon with cess, that in, is uh, access to the module map from the parent compartment um, for the purposes of interpreting various module descriptors. The uh and what inescapable globals are are globals that you would you would endow one compartment with that are guaranteed to also be endowed on all child compartments going forward um and non and not be over and be and have precedence over an endowments that are are provided on child compartments um yeah, so that's the those are the two dimensions: globals versus inescapable globals, um, the global assign versus global pro pro uh, property graft, and uh, and then the other dimension that we that that Richard is coming to bear on with regard to what is normal, what is no, what is the normal enumerability property of a property on the global object. Okay, so. I am going to form a opinion and state it as a straw poke. Straw poke. Uh, could could I get a clarification first? Yes. Um, does any of the options mentioned uh, include copying uh, property descriptors, including getters and setters? Yes. Yeah. Um, so imagine imagine a version of Cess that had both a globals endowment, uh, pardon, a globals option and a global properties option. Okay. The globals option would have a sign like semantics, and the properties would have property descriptor grafting semantics. All right, I have all the clarification I needed. Okay, so. Uh, the interesting, uh, so Richard, I think that the interesting component of this is that your your beef with grafting property descriptors um, 
and respecting the enumerable property of that property descriptor instead of masking it out. Uh, am, am I right that you're proposing that the enumerable that the enumerability of a property descriptor be overridden when grafting it from the option to the inescapable globals? Yeah, I think as default behavior that makes sense. It's it's also consistent with what happens right now. The for for the inescapable wrapper, yeah. The um so the in so there's the inescapable wrapper right now is doing approximately assigned semantics, except for these two two differences. One is that it's only doing spring name rather than spring and symbol name, which I think we all agree was just an oversight. And the other one is that it's um, making you know all the target properties it's creating, they're all non-enumerable. Under Chris's suggestion where we partition the inescapables into inescapable globals and inescapable global properties, um, I took Richard's the, the the one I I took Richard's um, recommendation is really more with regard to the inescapable globals, i.e., that the object assigns some. So I would I would also take Richard's criticism to the endowments themselves, the normal compartment endowments, that the that everywhere we're, we're currently saying object assigned semantics. We should say object assigned semantics except make the target property non-enumerable. Okay, I agree. That's that's yeah. Uh, so my uh, my position is so for one, I have two positions. One pertains to the to the wrapper that Mark you're that you're changing, and I uh, I am I am. I, I believe that your PR has additional constraints uh, for like backward compatibility expectations and such, and and may not be consistent with the design that I propose for the compartment constructor. Um, like if there is a compatibility reason, well, the compatibility story for for the wrapper is uh, with the prior implementations of that wrapper, and I could buy. I could buy Richard's argument that we should preserve the non uh, preserve the existing behavior, even though it's inconsistent with the principles. I think we should follow for compartment. Does that make sense? No. Okay. Um, I mean, it may, I mean, it makes sense, but I I, I think it's not. I, I think when, once we go into the specifics, that that you will disagree with what you just said. Okay. All right. So what I let me let me uh, uh, let me speak specifically to what I think we should do with Cess. With CES, I think it makes sense to. Um, I think that it. I think that our original decision to separate the concern of grafting pro, uh, properties through the prop by through direct direct manipulation of global this from the object assign like semantics is good. I think that we should keep that design. That easy things should be easy. You pass globals in through the globals option in the normal case. Uh, and if you want to graft a property descriptor with an arbitrary property to descriptor, you can do that by mutating the global this um, using the, the the defined property API. Um, for I uh, I think that Richard's Richard's suggestion that global endowments should by default be non enumerable. I think that that I agree that we should change the compartment API possibly with a flag. Uh, possibly with a compatibility flag to preserve backward compatibility, um, that the uh, that the endowments should be should be copied with object assigned but made non enumerable. We should make that okay. change. Good. Um, I think that if compartment were to implement uh, inescapable globals, that we should do it in an analogous fashion. That there would be an ines inescapable globals option. That would use the same transfer semantics as globals. Okay, good, good. Um, and that there should also that the compartment instance should provide an inescapable globals property that you can manipulate with. Um, uh, so I'm not I'm not as convicted. My convictions on this one are a little torn, but uh, it would be consistent with that design to introduce an inescapable globals property on the compartment object that would 
uh, that the that the holder could directly manipulate to change the properties that would be inherited by all subsequent compartments constructed within that compartment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I, yes. Um, and, yeah. And if and if we had that, um, I think that your suggestion about also having an option of inescapable global properties that copies the descriptors is coherent, but I would just omit it. I just don't think it's needed. I agree. I agree. I think that we have a choice between having an a a an uh a, a I, we we made a choice a long time ago to not have a global properties option, and instead have uh a, and and instead let the user manipulate global this directly after construction. I okay. I propose that we continue with that policy for the inescapable. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. And that so Richard, if if uh, if you if that all sounds good to you, and if nobody else on this call disagrees, I think we have a consensus. Yeah, that um, that sounds. Oh, go ahead. I could play the devil's advocate for a few more seconds, uh, because I don't understand the benefit of having endowments be non-enumerable in the context of specific endowments that we want to give to, uh, some code as powers especially when these are the kinds of powers that the software running in the compartment might want to do feature detection for. Okay. You can do feature detection on unenumerable properties. Um, yeah, if you if you check for the existence of a specific property, but you cannot uh, list them and make decisions based on the list, which is, I know, a well, made you, up example. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder what we're uh, what we're benefiting okay. by making them non-enumerable. So for one, so, for one, the devil already has enough lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Point taken. <laughs> for two. <laughs> for two, I think that. Uh, uh yeah I I I I I appreciate the point about feature detection. I think in practice that feature detection is rarely done through enumeration. It's mm -hmm. it's it's usually usually done through direct property check. Yeah, uh, uh, and you can also enumerate all properties rather than just the enumerable properties quite easily. The the reason why yeah. I would strongly favor the non enumerable is that to a large extent. The, the purpose of the endowments is to emulate some other host environment. And the, the, the normal case for globals provided by some other host or to virtualize your own host is for globals provided by some host, the, the normal practice is that they're non-enumerable. So it's a better fidelity for emulating normal host practice to just make them non-enumerable. Yeah. So for the record, I'm uh, I don't have a strong uh, reason to make these uh -huh. points because Lav Sorry, mode is understood. grafting onto uh, uh, is grafting everything onto the existing uh -huh. global this. So uh, I was just surprised that we uh -huh. want this level of fidelity. I see Chip. Yeah, I, it, it, this just kind of trying to follow this discussion kind of highlights something which has bugged me for a long time, which is that um, innumerable is a terrible, terrible name <laughs> for an attribute. Um, because, for example, get own property descriptors enumerates, among other things, the non enumerable properties. So it's like, yep. Whoa, whoa. Yep. And so, I mean, while we're yeah. airing grievances, why is the word innominate? Because we're not assigning numbers to things; we're assigning names to them and and going over them in order. We're in order. It's ordinate, people. It's ordinate. There's, there's a yes. I'll refrain from commenting on that. <laughs> <laughs> 
we have other things on the agenda that are yeah. less so, entertaining uh, but more important. Yeah. So th this one actually has more of a historical coherent reason than for m many of the random things in the spec, which is prior to ECMAScript 5, you actually couldn't enumerate the non-enumerables. And we added, uh, specifically in ECMAScript 5, we added object get own property names to enumerate all of the own properties in order to be able to build a SESH ship, you know, in order to be able to build the first SES, because we had to be able to remove everything not on our whitelist. And if you can't enumerate them, you can't check it against the whitelist and remove the ones you don't know about. So, so the 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 assignment semantics that we were discussing earlier, which copies all the properties and they all wind up as enumerable on the no 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 no, o no. object assigned semantics only copies enumerable own properties. Oh, okay. But 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 the the change in semantics is we want the 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 properties it creates on the target object to all be non enumerable which is I very see. much not object assigned semantics anymore. Uh, but but I think we we all got agreement that that's what we actually want. Yes, no, I, I wasn't I wasn't uh, speaking to that. I was merely speaking to the 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 what sounded to me like a a, a magic transmogrification that happened in the course of being assigned. Um, but it sounds like I was just misunderstanding what was what it actually did. Okay, um, Richard, do you feel? Oh, so we haven't actually answered the question of what Mark should do in his PR, but so far think, we've talked think, about I what think, we could I do. Think, I think we have, except for compatibility issues, and on compatibility issues, uh, I'm. I'll just state I'm more adventurous than you are, in and and this is based on. Ex, you know, long experience on TC39, where with an installed base of, you know, many orders of magnitude, more code, finding that, uh, whose law is it that, you know, everything becomes part of your, your, um, uh, Hiram's, you know, Hiram, Hiram's yeah. law. Yeah. So Hiram's law is true in the limit the entire installed base of the web is very far from having reached that limit. Therefore, the installed base of users of the Seth shim, and especially of fairly new features of the Seth shim, is so far from the Hiram law limit that being empirical about whether it actually breaks something is, is often justified if we don't think it would break any actual thing, we don't have to. We don't have to be so tread so lightly with regard to. Well, in theory, somebody might be depending on. It. So, so what you're saying is the JavaScript spec allows for so many different wacky things that there are, in fact, wacky things that no one has done. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, and I like that way to put it. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, whereas my my experience as being an abuser of wacky abilities uh, is to to assume that everybody else is doing that too. <laughs> All right. Um yeah, I'm can okay. So so I am willing to I am willing to to resign uh, my position on the on the on Mark's PR. Um no, don't resign your position on my PR. Just, just approve it. <laughs> okay, that works too. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um. So I'll. Yeah. Okay. I'll. I'll approve the PR. The. Um. And and we have a design going forward. Should we choose to move an escapable global center compartment, Richard? Are we in accord? Yeah, I couldn't be happier. All right. So. For future versions of the compartment API, um, 
a long time ago, I suggested to the XS folks that the compartment API, even though I couldn't imagine them changing and <laughs> changing their implementation, which the SES shim mirrors, um, was that the compartment shouldn't privilege any of its options above, above uh, other options and should simply take an options bag as its first argument. You're not, you are not less likely, you, you are, you are just as likely to construct a compartment that lacks any of the options, like lacking a module map or lacking endowments versus lacking a now hook, a load hook or an import hook or a resolve hook, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes sense that since they are all options, that it should just be an options bag. And XS, the folks at Modable, um, took that and ran with it. The, the compartment on XS only accepts an options bag as its first argument, which is not what we do with the compartment API in CES. And we, I, I think that in order to get to parity with XS so that we can have one set of code examples on hardenjs.org, among other things, um, is that we should try to converge on what XS has done. The mechanism to get there is that there are a number of features that need to migrate. For example, um, dynamic, the import and the import method of a compartment on the CES shim returns a promise for a module namespace that has been wrapped in an envelope object with a namespace property. And the reason for this is that we in some distant past before me decided that the import, that the import method should defeat the then ability of modules. That if you did an import on a thenable module, that it should be defeated. Uh, this has been a stance that has long since been lost. <laughs> we, we sorry, have, what, I'm sorry, what does defeated mean? I don't understand operationally what should happen. That you should get that, that the then method of the namespace of, of the of the uh, if you were to export a then method on a module, just importing using dynamic import or compartment import should not call that method. That is a spooky side effect of it of import. Doesn't occur if you do a static import, for example. It doesn't happen if you do import now. Are we following? Uh, I mean, isn't there, didn't the web already, I'm not the web, I'm sorry. Didn't the JavaScript for, for dynamic import already do the other thing? Yes. yes. Dynamic import calls the then method of a namespace that has a then method. So d doesn't that mean we're stuck with that? We are stuck with dynamic import having that behavior, yes. We are not stuck with the current compartment behavior. The current compartment behavior is that import returns a namespace ob an object with a namespace property. Okay, so for things that return a namespace as opposed to return a promise for a namespace, um, that makes we have, sense. We have no we have no issues at the moment. Import now returns the namespace directly of the of the requested module. There's no envelope. Okay. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Envelope, okay. Okay. Yeah, so I'm proposing that we add a dunderbar no namespace box uh, option to the compartment that will cause the compartment.import method to be consistent with both XS and dynamic import on the web or dynamic uh, import at large. I'm also proposing that we'll need a dunderbar, a dunderbar option to change the behavior of um, uh, uh, of the the assignment semantics for the globals, which brings me to the other thing I pro propose, which is that um, if the first argument of the compartment constructor is an object, and that object has a dunderbar ses dunderbar symbol 
property that that indicates that the compartment only has one options bag argument. And the reason I'm proposing this is that it would have the same behavior. If, if you were to construct a compartment with this symbol cess uh, property on the first argument, that that code example, for one, would look good on hardenjs.org and require very little explanation, but also would work on excess just as well as with cess in a, in a future version. Uh, 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 uh. Okay. And uh, is, there, is there a deprecate? I mean, once we do that, is there a deprecation path yes. for eventually removing it? Yes, in a major version. Well, we have, it, okay. so so all all existing behavior, all existing compartment constructors that pass three arguments would be immediately deprecated. Okay. In, okay. in favor of this behavior, uh, and we could okay. and we could issue warnings if we cared to, um, but yeah, we 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 would in the in our current major version train immediately deprecate the three argument form, insist. And, and make it normal to pass this cess symbol property to all compartment constructors such that in the fullness of time, all, comp all, all usage has that symbol property, at which point we could cut a major version and then the symbol property would simply be ignored in the next, in the next version. Um, and, okay. the, and the three argument, uh, the, the three argument form would be, um, would no longer work. Okay. Okay, I'm satisfied. Okay, um, then the next thing is, what is the value for that symbol? I am proposing, and I think that Richard and I have an agreement at this point, is that it should be the semver of the version of CES that you are using, and that, wow. and that over time, we would be able to imply... Uh, each, we, we, as, as we evolve CES, we would be able to a, a gradually make some of the warts, um, the like having to have an, an, a Dunderbar no namespace box Dunderbar property in order for it to behave the same way as XS. We could make those implicit with successive versions of CES so that there would only be one wart property until we cut the next major version. When you exactly. say the value, the value would be the semver string, the caller mm -hmm. who provides the value. Yes. And it's the callee who pays attention to the presence of the symbol. Does the callee pay attention to the value? The pay, the callee would decide which options are implicit for each for each version, right? Um, so if uh, so, for example, I am proposing that the value be the current, pardon, I am proposing that with each release of CES, we can then say, um, if you choose this value, then you you do not have to specify these additional CES specific deprecation, deprecated options uh, or options for specific deprecated behaviors, right? And if you prov if the caller provides the previous semver, then they still must provide those things. Yes. And this allows them to uh, that this allows the caller to decide uh, because the caller is in a position where it needs to decide um, it needs to decide which options. It wants to affect, and it want, and then they may want to embrace those options in an order based off of um, what accommodations they have to make at their call sites. Um, like taking co the concrete example of no namespace box as an option, it's not enough to say that it's deprecate that that we're. It's not enough to 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 turn that option on. You have to go and look at every place where you're calling compartment.import and make an adjustment. Right. Okay. So, um, so and and suppose that you also have um, want to change the behavior of the global assign. Well, that might be easier. It might be that you, if you wanted to embrace the all all endowments are non enumerable by default, that's an easier option to turn on. 
because it doesn't, it might, it probably doesn't require any accommodations on your side. But there's a, as we, as I discover parity gaps between excess and cess, um, Okay. I like I like the ability of uh, I like both being able to say you can embrace these options incrementally. Like you can make your accommodations and separate pull requests. Um, in order to embrace these new, def uh, these new behaviors that should be default in the in the next major version of CES. But I also like the idea that, um, with Cess version 1.1.1, if the caller says that I'm using Cess 1.1.1, that this bag of these this bag of options is implied so that we can keep the code examples on hardenjs.org concise. And to keep our okay. parity tests concise. So I'm going to not not strongly object, but I'll I'll say why this whole thing makes me very uncomfortable which is, you know, on, on both the web, well, primarily on the web, we've seen the attempt to do, declare, you know, declaring what version you think you're compatible with, and then have, have the, the, uh, the implementation trying to provide you the version you think you're compatible with, and to have a bunch of cases in the implementation to do that, We've seen that fade out over time um, and uh, and fade out largely through frustration, which is it was both complicated for the implementer to provide this case explosion of supporting different versions from the same engine uh, and frustration, especially from the user side, which is it didn't actually solve their problem very much. Um, and more of a, you know, the and you know to the point where um, HTML5 stopped minor numbering HTML, um, mm -hmm. and it was it stopped just, major you know, numbering HTML. Not major, yes, not now <laughs> just HTML, not HTML5 versus HTML6. Yeah, um, and to your point also, CSS has stopped doing the the X prefix yeah. for new CSS properties. Yeah, and and you know JavaScript has certainly uh, avoided temptation to do version num number adaptation. And I remember there was more ad hoc version adaptation back in the old days, although it wasn't a, a version number per se in JavaScript. Um, but there's oh. like all that weirdness weirdness that we've inherited about docu document document all emulation. Oh my God. Yeah, so I mean, a library isn't doesn't uh, libraries don't have the same problems as the web. We can make a breaking change in the future to clear up our mess. Um, the web doesn't get to do that. Um, the but I am totally sympathetic to making this as simple as possible. Um, the. I don't see a way out of needing to express options for some of these cases because they are pervasively relied upon. The behave the existing behaviors are pervasively relied upon in some cases. I could see not. I could see, for example, not embracing. Um, I could see, for example, not using an option to do the the change for enumerability of globals in order to avoid a complication. Like take the. Take the risk, do the experiments, verify that this is not a change. This change does not have any observable behavior in practice for all the way out to contracts on the chain. It probably, Good. which is probably the case. We could probably Good. do this without it. it. It's just a lot of a lot of verification. The um the uh but for the namespace box, there's no way out of it. We have we have to have an option for that. Yeah, so I would just make the option for specific feature transitions. Just make an option that's specific to that feature transition that's named for the feature transition, and not tie it to version. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we will still need that symbol named property. 
but the value now no longer with that with that reasoning the value may as well be true mm -hmm. um or may as well yeah. be truthy and now if you want to provide a version string you can yeah <laughs> right <laughs> um yeah okay we'll run with that it can be truthy and then it can grow from there if it needs to but but our hope our hope is that we discard the symbol named property anyway in the next yep. major. Yep. Um, but what this means is that all of the examples on hardenjs.org are going to have to have a whole bunch of dunder, uh, potentially a whole bunch of dunder options. At least, mm -hmm. at least this cess, uh, this this cess symbol and the no namespace box option, which is survivable i suppose mm -hmm. okay all right we've got five eight eight minutes for all of zb and leo's topics sorry about that <laughs> I, oh it's all have to go like through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh so uh we can postpone the one about uh cess uh under csp unless anyone has anything off the top of their head uh because what what i'm confused about is that um we were experimenting with using lava mode's webpack plugin uh and got a content security policy error and didn't really figure out where it was coming from. So I started from a clean slate, uh, took CES, uh, and called lockdown under content security policy that forbids eval, uh, which is default for content security policy. Mm -hmm. And I did that for our uh, smoke test in the repository by just adding the content security policy to that, and everything seemed to work. Um, right, everything. Why? Everything. Did you, I mean, I know that it got, I know it, that lockdown ran to completion, which is surprising to me. Um, did you check to, did, did you exhaust? There, there was no error. And when I added a call to eval before calling lockdown, I got an error. That's how I checked. I didn't debug it because debugging headless browsers under, um, uh, under instrumentation is difficult. But I also tried it on a clean page uh, in, the, in the regular browser, and it seemed to run lockdown correctly. I need to keep experimenting with that, but it uh, doesn't add up with what I know about CES, which is there's a section in lockdown that uses eval to get to run a string that represents a function to get the function constructor for regular and generator and async generator functions. So I yeah. don't know why I'm getting positive results from running it under CSP. It's, Any it's, ideas? My my thought is that it's possible that all of those are in a try catch and that it's simply silently failing, which is very concerning. Like, Cess should loudly fail, and it might be that it might be that if we absolutely need to call eval in or or the function constructor and actually call the function that we constructed, um, it might be that we need to put a a safety eval somewhere to ensure that lockdown fails in the absence of the ability to call eval. But there's I don't also an assert direct eval available. Uh, but maybe it's not calling it, just checking if it's there. So I'm going to have to dig deeper into that, but just wanted to let you know that I'm getting unexpected results, and I was hoping to get uh, some clarification on what the expectations should be. Should CES work under content security policy? My My feeling is that if we can contrive a way to make it work, under under a no eval CSP, we should because we know that you can do other things under the lockdown environment without relying upon the uh, relying upon compartment evaluate. Yeah. Um, but if if we can't lock down without eval, like if we can't reach, if we just can't reach all of the intrinsics, 
without eval, then we should definitely fail. I can't imagine any way to, to test for the availability of direct eval without calling. I don't know of any other way to do to test for that. I agree. So, okay. they're, they're... so I need to I need to dig deeper and uh, report back, but I'm going to do that async. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. To, and yeah, I thank you for taking that on. That's something that we should investigate as well. Um. All right. Next, Hermes. Cool. Yeah, I probably got two and a half minutes right. Um. So yeah, my question is that um. And well, just to recap, we know that Hermes is already missing async arrow functions and async generators. Um, so the async missing async generators we've already dealt with in this draft PR here. I'll just put it there. Um, and yeah, we've created a function in commons.js to um, use that as a condition. So the remaining question is we've got um, some async arrow functions in CES. So those are load, drain queue, async trampoline, and there's a few that are coming and going. So it looks like we've got three choices. Should we either use normal arrow functions, which I've done currently in the PR? I know you've got a strong preference for um, arrow functions, but yeah, should we use normal functions? Then that's not gonna be a problem with Hermes. Um, another option looks like we could use a similar commons function, which does a try catch, but I think that could be messy with async arrow functions if they're using the this keyword, which they're currently not. And then ZB pointed out, which I didn't know that, um, in the make bundle, we've got a archive options parameter. And that archive options parameter has a module transforms property, which we could potentially use to transform um, async arrow functions to make Hermes happy. So yeah, what do we think of those three choices? So that last uh, let, let me clarify that we we could very carefully introduce a uh, babel based transform or babel based transform uh, to only do that for specific files because I double checked and the module location and specifier are also mentioned uh, to the transform function. Uh, so we could uh, very carefully transform uh, away the async uh, arrow functions uh, and get away with using them in the main source. The question is, is that uh, which of those seems more appealing? Uh, that's that's the question we again? wanted to bring up. Can, can you say it all three again? Yep, sure. So um, use normal async functions instead of arrow functions which I've already done in the pull request. And um, then the second option would be, so if you have a chance to look at the link I posted there, um, right now for async generators, we're dealing with that with a try catch, which is wrapped in a new function. So Hermes doesn't error when it's building. So we could potentially do a try catch, um, try to use an async arrow function. If it's fine, use it. If it's not fine, just use a normal async function. Um, and then the third option is um, make bundles archive options, which has a property called module transforms. So the the, the transform, uh, you're tra you would be transforming an async arrow function into something else. Yeah. What would you be transforming it into? An an async function without the arrow, and then uh, and and what if the async arrow function mentions this? Yeah, uh, so the transform would do the correct transform ideally um, so that the, this keyword is doing the right thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the implementation of the module transform yet, but that would need to be done correctly. Yeah. Oh, Initially, we, we can error out if it uh, mentions this uh, at all, because uh, we don't have a lot of need for the this keyword in the implementation of uh, SES itself. Uh, I guess classes are not a very popular abstraction in there. Uh, so maybe that transform would never have to uh, implement this, but it would have to warn us uh, if it ends up needed. Okay. Oh, the other reason. thing, the the, sorry, the the other thing you could transform into, which would preserve the async arrow function this semantics, is a async concise method. Mm, uh -huh. Async method is going to respect this, isn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're correct. 
async, a concise method has function this behavior, not arrow this behavior. You're correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that constrains your option. You'd have to. So if this is a transform for the purposes of just bundling CES with the CES bundler um, so that the distribution files don't have async arrow functions. Yeah, that's the idea um, for, for the specific distribution file for uh, Hermes. We could have that transform added so that we don't have to uh, abide by Hermes in the source files for things that are uh, fairly simple to find and transform. This is a, uh, the, the, the attractive thing about this. The unattractive thing is having more babble, but the, the attractive thing to, to maintaining more babble, the attractive thing about it is that it would, it would free us specifically me and Mark of the concern of um, making sure that we use the right type of function um, in, in the source. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't, we wouldn't trip on Hermes CI jobs for mysterious reasons for unrelated changes. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you're, so, so, so Chris, you're just make, be, be clear. You're voting for the transform. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm stating the pros and cons. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let let me just ask another question about the transform. Um, if if the original is const foo equals async error function, would the transform be const foo equals async function expression, or would it be an async function declaration? And I'll tell you the reason that I'm asking is really for the export case. Um, uh, an exported function, I believe including an exported async function declaration, uh, exports the value early, which is the, the one of the fatal problems. Well, the fatal problem, it's the worst problem with, with function functions. Um, uh, but if you, transform it into export const name equals async function expression, then there's no problem. It's only a problem if you're just directly exporting the name declaration. I, I read that as a constraint for the transform rather than... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, with, so with that constraint, I would, I'm, I'm voting for the transform. Is this, is this, uh, okay. Um, I, I am voting against the try catch. I don't, I don't see that. I don't see a win. Yeah. I would like to take option two with a try catch off the table and let's talk about option one and three. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. All right. So option one is that uh, option one essentially requires us to uh, would oblige us to avoid using async arrow functions and ace and async generators and async generators. Are there any async generators? There, there are not. No, we're using, we're using. I mean, they're going to be problematic uh, anyway. So let's focus on async arrow functions. <laughs> yeah. So async arrow functions. Um, if we had a lint rule, so 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 there are, there are two things that happen in option underneath option one. We would need to have a lint rule that covers cess saying that forbidding async arrow functions and suggesting using an async function. Um, as a minimum, we don't want to wait as we do not want to have to wait for CI to tell us that Hermes broke and then yeah. send non Hermes engineers off into debugging Hermes. <laughs> um, um, I have one more, uh, observation about option three. It's, um, quite likely that we are going to need a transform anyway, uh, a transform that would um, 
modify very specific files uh, in a way that adapts them to Hermes uh, without modifying the main version of uh, SAS in cases where we can't do that with a try catch, like uh, in the currently open pull requests. There, there's one adaptation that we might need to do for Hermes that I'm not sure if it's going to be possible without that kind of transform anyway. So it is possible that the transform is going to exist and we're deciding whether we want to have it also transform the async arrow functions or only do the, the, the find and replace kind of things that we're going to need to do on the AST. Is this restriction in Hermes temporary? I mean, do the Hermes folk, do they set, have they stated that they plan to implement async arrow functions? They, uh, they have a vague overall intention of implementing uh, ECMAScript spec uh, in total, uh, but their priorities and schedules uh, are not very public. We know that this it's not happening very soon, but we don't know much about uh, anything that's uh, long-term on the roadmap. Eventually, this problem will go away. Yeah. If, yeah, we know, either, don't know how either, long it's going to take. Right. It will either go away when Facebook defunds Hermes and deprecates it, or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, or they finish the job. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a transform that's going to have to live inside of the tooling for, for of CES itself. Um, we already depend on Babel for the tooling in CES itself, so that isn't a problem. Um, I guess I'm I'm leaning on I'm leaning to transform. Cool. Okay. And cool. And the next question was, um, yeah, you guys were discussing it before. Um, so one of the big blockers. Oh, on oh, 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 oh. I, I ask you to think about the in, how this works intersectionally with your CSP issue, because Hermes I know. is eval under a try catch. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. yeah that, 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 win, that eval should fail under CSP despite the presence of an async generator prototype, which could mislead wow. lockdown wow. under CSP into misunderstanding the nature of its environment. Um, yeah, I'm aware of that contradiction and considering uh, whether we're going to need to change it to a, a, a function that uh, creates uh, the, the right function references locally without using eval uh, with a switch statement uh, and use that instead of the uh, nice looking but very powerful eval of string. The uh, It's possible that Mark's suggestion that you filter on whether it's syntax error may be sufficient to distinguish CSP from Hermes, but... Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, go ahead, Leo. Sorry for the interruption. Sure. So the first point of failure um, when running CES with Hermes is assert direct eval available. So that, um, and the reason is because uh, eval is excluded from support um, with Hermes as well. So yeah, we get the error, which is um, CES cannot initialize unless eval is the origin, original intrinsic eval. So question is, can we detect if it's on Hermes? And if so, skip it? Would that be an issue or not? So the reason for that test, catch me if I'm wrong, Mark, the reason why we're testing whether direct eval is available um 
is because we are not confident that the, the shim is correct in the absence of eval, right? Well, or we in... know that the shim is not correct. In the abs I mean, the shim inherently relies on direct eval, right? Yes. I mean, the, 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 magic, the eight magic lines of code. So that, so, so, rather, uh, so, so if you're using CES, if you're using lockdown, but not using compartment evaluate. Okay. Um, there's a potential valid use case there. Are we confident that lockdown can it, run to it, completion correctly without dynamic eval or without direct eval? So what does it replace the eval function and the function constructor? That's a good question. We need to dig into that, but yeah, it's definitely not the original. Um, yeah, because the the in order to construct the safe eval function in the safe function constructor for the start compartment, you still need a direct eval. Would that be possible to replace with an implementation based on the uh, Faro function constructor? When you say an implementation based on Faro fun function constructor, if you're trying, how would you build a safe evaluator out of the Faro function constructor if you don't have direct eval? Um, so the thing is, Specifically for Hermes, eval is not implemented, but a tiny subset of uh, function constructor of string uh, is somehow implemented. I, I don't remember the details, but if anything intends to use the function constructors uh, the function in constructor Hermes. Gives, gives, function constructor at most gives you the functionality of indirect eval, um, mm -hmm. but you still, so given the, the, given the feral function constructor and, and, but no ability to do a direct eval, I don't see any way to construct a safe function constructor. Okay, that was, that's the answer to my question. <laughs> yeah, it, okay. it, that we're using direct eval in the magic lines in the quadruple backflip, if you will, to mm -hmm. arrange for to arrange for the confined code to receive a scope, and in order for that scope to be seen by the code un under confinement, it has to use direct eval. Mm -hmm. it, has, it has to see the lexical context. Yeah, or which means or... we would have to replace it with a no up. Yeah, or let's um, if you if you do have indirect eval available, there's the old the old set oh, technique magic. of splicing a prelude postlude around the code and then indirectly evaluating it, where the prelude postlude does is essentially the thing that the that that is before and after the call to direct eval in the magic lines, right? If you just basically, mm -hmm. if, if you just splice the code you're evaluating into the position that's currently occupied by direct eval, that actually does give you, does reproduce the safety. Uh, you're still doing a width on a proxy. Uh, you still have to have sloppy mode in order to do the width. Um, but all of that would work by splicing without direct eval. Yeah, a, a while back, I uh, tried that for Hermes and also removing uh, the width proxy and replacing that with uh, a pre-generated list of arguments to the function, and that somewhat works. Uh, and where the pre-generated argument list sh shadows all of the globals. Yeah. Okay. All of the globals yeah. we're aware of. So dynamically creating new globals needs to be prevented uh, otherwise. And 
if you remember, I demoed that and it turns out that freezing global this uh, is possible under Hermes, which closes the gap and makes ah. it uh, safe. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I believe that. I believe that splicing plus shadowing plus non-extensible global this all to together, and you have to be careful. It's not just global this itself, but but the uh, prototype chain above it. Um, mm -hmm. So a chain, but, so a chain that I might accept. Yeah, I, I, with Mark's caveats, long list of caveats about how to carefully implement this. Um, something that I would be willing to consider is making more use of package imports and we might have to add, do some more work to get package package descriptor imports to uh to work under our bundle.js um or, or under the compartment mapper in general there's there's some more work there i think um but we could have a hermes specific implementation of uh make safe evaluator or whichever one it is uh, and only use s certain portion uh, and create a distribution specific to Hermes that way. Yeah. 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 And, and then the other thing that, that old Cess did, which we need to carefully reintroduce is that the prelude is all on one line uh, without a new line at the end of the prelude. Um, so that the line numbers of the spliced encoder are preserved. Yeah. Okay. okay. Did we run to the end of the list of questions? Yeah. Um, pretty much. So. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm going to call that the endo meeting. And thank you for coming.